All right, JoeyRitter.com on Twitter at Joey Ritter. Look who I got today. I got Darren Pfeiffer, drummer of Goldfinger and the Salads, joining us from Toronto, right? That is right, Canada. Now, how long have you been in Toronto for? I've been in Toronto for 10 years exactly. Okay. Now I moved here in 2002, and uh, I love it, man. I got married to a Canadian girl and then divorced her ass. <laughs> and once I got a passport, I was like, you're out of here. And uh, <laughs> it's not quite how it worked out, but we did get, we did split up. But I, I love it here. I mean, it's it's a it's a hockey culture, it's a beer culture, it's a uh, it's hockey and beer and, and chicken wings, and I love it. I, and I, I get free health, I get free healthcare, and I'm only two hours away from the Sabers. <laughs> I was there three years ago, and it's exactly what you described. I got, I was there. I checked out a Leafs game. I visited the Hall of Fame, and you know, drank Molson the whole time. So I'm with you, but. Um, <laughs> I actually thought, you know, before I started following you on Twitter and listening to your Sport Beats podcast, I actually thought you were a Los Angeles Kings fan, you know, because you would wear Kings jerseys all the time and, you know, Goldfinger was based outside of California. So I thought congratulations were in order for the cup, but unfortunately, you know, being a Sabres fan, actually uh, a team that's a little bit more pathetic than my Flyers. So, well, I want to start by saying I actually am a Sabres fan. I was living in Los Angeles from 92 to 2002, and I was a big fan of, the, of the, the team for a long time. And I figured I could be because they weren't really in any kind of direct competition. There was no rivalry between the West Coast Kings and the East Coast Sabres. They didn't play each other hardly ever, maybe once a year. There was no, no playoff animosity or rivalry. So really, well, I became a Kings fan. And then shortly after I lived in LA, I started working for the Kings. I wrote a song for the Kings, got me a job there. Uh, I was director of game presentation for a while. I started to uh, write some more songs, a goal song. I wrote a rally song. I wrote a song that came under the ice for. So it was really cool. I got season tickets and a bunch of money. It was a really cool. So I am a Kings fan. Okay. So I was there in L.A. when they won the Cup. I, was, I went to the games. I was, I was, uh, I was present. I, I was incredible to, to be around the people and, and enjoy that, that Cup victory. So it was a big thrill for me to see them go through the Stanley Cup Finals the way they did and just lay waste to every team that, that they faced. It was, it was an incredible run. But, yeah, I am a Sabres fan from Buffalo originally, and the Sabres will always be number one. If there was a Cup Final with – L.A. And, and Buffalo, L.A. wouldn't exist. Oh, yeah. All about the blue and the gold and, and the Buffalo Sabres. So Sabres, number one. Okay. Uh, now, the songs that you were talking about that you wrote for the Kings, was one of them the Wayne Gretzky song? No, it wasn't. That song was just a song I wrote because growing up in Buffalo uh, in the 80s, like – the Sabres never really did any damage in the playoffs or never even made the playoffs. Right. So what bu local Buffalo stations got was the, uh, the Oilers feeds. That, that was always the best rated hockey. So they, they put it on, on TV. So I always caught the Oilers going just bananas through the Stanley Cup finals and just killing teams and Gretzky and Curry and, and Messier and Grenfier. So I became a big uh, Gretzky fan because every year come, come playoff time, it was Gretzky just winning the cup every year, so it was a big thrill for me. Well, so so doing the show out of Toronto, and obviously you're interviewing a lot of hockey players, and you wrote a pretty intimate song about Wayne Gretzky. So has do you know if he's actually ever heard the song? Yeah, he has. It's a funny story. Uh, when I was living in L.A., I put it on my first solo record, uh, a stupid little collection of punk rock songs called The Revenge of Chicken McNuggets. And uh, I don't even know if I have any more later on. I'm sure I do somewhere. But anyway, I put it on there, and his wife heard it. And his wife ordered some CDs through a, a mutual friend, okay. so I, I gave her four CDs, and one came back to me signed by Wayne Gretzky. That was nice. a big thrill. So I, and apparently the story was he had a party at his house, and she put on the song, and he got really weird, weirded out about it. He had a, a, an uncomfortable chuckle, apparently, but he was, he was freaked out about it. Then I moved to Toronto, and there's a, a restaurant here called Wayne Gretzky's. It's a, a, it's a pretty cool hang, whatever, good, good pub food. Right. Um, it's kind of upscale now, but it, 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 back then it was a dirty little sports bar. So I used to go there all the time, and then when they revamped it and they fixed it up, uh, it was an invite only for the launch party, and I knew the manager there, so he got me in. Okay. So the Stanley Cup was there, Wayne and his parents were there, and I eventually made my way up to Wayne Gretzky because uh, he was being hounded all night. I walked up to him and said, I was with my wife at the time. Remember the girl I dumped? Right. <laughs> so I... So I, uh, I uh, walked up to him and I said, Hi, I'm Darren Pfeiffer, and I had a ticket to the 1993 game against the Canucks where he scored his 800 second goal. I was in the building for that. Okay. And that's a, actually a funny story. So I had to take it and I walked up to him 
and I said, hey, will you sign this? He's like, oh, wow, I remember this game. I go, yeah, I'm sure you do. It's a pretty big milestone in your career. And I go, I'm Darren Pfeiffer. And he started to sign the ticket, and he didn't even know who I was until I said, I'm dangerous, Darren. And he stopped in mid-signature, looked up at me, like, <laughs> and I, and I, I let, put my arm around my wife, and I'm like, this is my wife. I'm completely heter heterosexual. I have no interest in you whatsoever. Um, I just like watch. I, I like hockey, and you're my favorite hockey player. It's a funny song, and I'm sorry if it made you uncomfortable. So he's finishing signing a few other things, and he goes, you know, it's, it is kind of weird. When you, when, when you hear a song about a guy that wants to have sex with you, he goes, you can understand, right? Sure. I go, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, so the second time, that, that, that second time, that wasn't the first time I met him. The first time I met him was in L.A. At a, at a Staples Center at a game. And I was working at the Kings at the time, and I walked into Gretzky's suite. I knocked on the door, and Janet Gretzky answered the, the door. She's like, can I help you? And I go, I work for the Kings. I wrote a song, and I wanted to just you know, say hi to, to Wayne. So I walk in, and Wayne's talking to two of his buddies. Janet has me. She goes, oh, hey, Wayne, this is Darren. He works for the Kings. He uh, is a music writer or whatever. He wants to say hi. And he goes, oh, come on over. So I walk over. And uh, no, no, what happens was she goes, he wants to say, he wants to say hi, get an autograph. And he goes, no. <laughs> and then he goes, I'm just fucking with you, man. Come on over. And he's drinking Bud Light in a can. He actually used the so, word fuck? Which I thought was weird. Like, you're Wayne Gretzky. Like, come on, you can have any beer in the world you want. You're drinking Bud Light in a can. <laughs> I thought it was weird. But anyway, yeah, he's heard the song, and we always have a laugh every time I see him. So, being that you're from Buffalo, the character that you portrayed at, at the end of the first Goldfinger album, um, the, you know, the Abbey Normal guy? Yeah. Is that loosely funny. based on yourself? Did you really play in a band called Repping Hammer? No, that was a big joke. I was on drugs. We smoked pot one day with my buddies, and we are all just calling people, cranking people, and... And we got this guy on the phone, and I was into like, I still am into death metal and speed metal and thrash and all kinds of stuff. But at the time, I think there was a band called Ripping Hammer out that I was digging. And I called this guy, and I told him I was on drugs. I told him I, I was sleeping on people's couches. I had no money. I had STDs. You know, well, and and af after all this shit, he still wanted to play in a band with me. And I remember thinking to myself, if some guy called me and told me all this stuff about himself, I wouldn't want to ever even meet him let alone be in a band with them. But you, so it was just really funny. You don't understand, though. I still quote that. To the, my wife will be like, hey, honey, can you get the stroll out of the trunk? And I'll be like, do you, do you play fast tempos with odd time signatures? And since she just looks at me like, uh, why, why did I marry you? So I might be the one getting dumped, actually. <laughs> That's a funny story. So um, on, your, on your podcast, uh, Sport Beats, let's, let's face it. Hockey players aren't known for their you know, outgoing personalities. Who out of all the people you've talked to do you think had the best personality and gave you, you know, a great interview? You know, Jeremy Roenick was pretty good. Uh, that's that's I mean, the first guy I would think of. Jeremy Roenick was amazing. Like uh, He was friends with Tony Amante, who was, was a big Goldfinger fan, which, oddly enough, I've never had on my show. I've, I've been going back and forth with Tony Amante, ex NHLer. Played for the Blackhawks, Phoenix, yep. Philly. Your, your Flyers, he played for them well, for a while. He, actually, I, let me, real quick. Now, the last time Toronto was in the playoffs was 2004. I was at that game. And Jeremy Roenick, you know, put him out of the playoffs. And I think Amante from Amante. got the pass assist. From yeah. Tony Amante. Yep. And the, Roenick shot went over his ex-goaltender, ex Ed Belfort. Right, right. In 2004. So. I was in the building. I was in the building for that game. So Ronick was the best best one out of out of everybody. Yeah, Ronick was really good. Uh, Paul Bissonnette re recently, I've had him on a couple times. He's great. He knows a lot oh, about yeah. music. Uh, as far as hockey players, I can't. Like, baseball players are really good. So are CFL football players. But okay. you know, every now and again, you get a guy like Henry Burris, the quarterback from the uh, Hamilton Ticats. So at the time I interviewed him, he was a Calgary Stampeder, uh, and uh, he uh, he was great. He was just going on and on and on and. Um, Every now and again, you'll get a guy who's just like, "Oh, you know what? I'm into all kinds of different things." And I'm like, "Why did I, I even? Why did I even agree to interview you if you're not going to give me band names or stuff that you've seen?" Scott Ian from Anthrax is a, is is the one that knows the most about uh, about sports. He he's a Yankee fan, and I had him on. But Ronick Ronick, as far as hockey players, was uh, the the most knowledgeable. Sure. Okay. Um, I actually talked to a friend who's a Goldfinger fan, and he told me to ask you if there's any plans to release the catalog on vinyl. That's a good question, and we got a friend of mine here in Canada who runs a radio station called um, PunkRadioCast.com, which is a, I do a show on there called The Darren and Darren Show, mm -hmm. the singer from Salads, another band I'm in here in Toronto that kind of sounds a bit like Goldfinger. Uh, they have a singer named Darren Dumas, 
So me and him do a, a show called The Darren and Darren Show, where we play all indie stuff from around the world uh, the last Tuesday of every month. So punkradiocast.com, go check it out. But anyway, the guy who owns Punk Radio Cast is a guy named Danny Keyes, and he is inquiring with us about putting out the first record on vinyl. Okay. And apparently, last time I talked to him, he said that he got an okay from the publisher and the record company to put it out. So in the next, I would say, hopefully next month or two, before Christmas, the first record will be out on vinyl. Nice. Which is a huge thrill for us. Oh, know, yeah, so. for sure. I mean, I can't believe it's not out already. Now, um, it's odd. Now the album after that, uh, called, an album called Hang Ups, when I think of great sophomore albums, that's the first album that comes to mind. I mean, that just was, you know, the first album, every single song was great, but then you come out with Hang Ups, every single song is great. Can you kind of describe, um, you know, the feeling in the studio as you guys were recording that album? Was, you know, a follow-up album, meeting expectations, was that even on your mind, or were you just writing songs? Well, John Feldman, our singer and primary songwriter, had, from the time we released our first record, we toured for a good year and a half, it seems like forever, just on and the road for a long, long, long time. So John had a collection of at least 30 songs. And there were so many songs that when we came time to, to put the songs on the record, there were so many songs to choose from. Um, it was really easy for John, a very prolific writer still. It wasn't like we got off the road and we're like, well, what are we going to do? We've got to come up with a bunch of bunch of songs it was easy like those those songs like lonely place and superman they were all ready to go and we had them ready to go it was just a matter of getting them produced and getting them recorded and, and recording that record was a lot of fun um we had two different producers uh two different engineers and uh it was a, it was a blast it really was a blast I, i'm not looking back on it now to be perfectly honest with you joey i'm not 100 percent keen on the way that record sounds Okay. If you listen to our first record, it's really bright, really tingy, pingy. Right. It's right. a lot of the notes come through. Whereas on Hang Ups, it sounds like there's a wet blanket on it. Uh, I don't like the way it was mixed, but you know what? At the end of the day, who gives a fuck? The songs are killer. And they came out really good, and people right. love it. Right. So you're right. As far as a sophomore record, I mean, I, I don't think we dropped off like some bands do. We we at least held straight. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Going so, from the self-titled to Hang Ups. Speaking of your uh, singer. Uh, John Feldman, um, he's pretty, you know, outspoken about uh, animal rights and that type of thing. So, my question to you is: Is the whole band kind of on his level, or, or are there nights where you're like, "All right, Feldy, we get it. You know, you don't like uh, people that kill animals. Can we play Mabel now?" No, actually, we've been playing Mabel the last couple tours, even though John just does not like that song. Uh -huh. he, he understands that it's a moment of the set where. Uh, kids come on stage and, and they just sing along to every word. They love it. Uh, but as far as his animal rights thing, he's, he's still into it. It's still a big part of his life, but he's not consumed by it uh, the last like four or five years like he has been, two years previous. Um, he doesn't really talk about it from the stage too much. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as who's into it in the band, I know that uh, John, John is the big one, of course, but uh, Charlie Paulson is, is vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't eat red meat. I eat chicken and fish. And Kelly is one carnivore-eating motherfucker. That, that guy... Can I swear? Is it okay to swear? Uh, you, you just, um, we can't change it now, so keep going. <laughs> well, you can bleep it out, can't you? Yeah, it's YouTube, sure. All right. Well, yeah, we can, we can throw it on a program and put a beep on it. Yeah. But from now on, I'll try to, I'll try to watch my mouth. Okay. But yeah, Kelly is just one meat-eating guy. He loves it. and We don't flaunt it in John's face. You know, we don't go, look, I got a cheeseburger. But... Uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's something that's important to him, so we try to stand behind him as much as we can. Now, uh, one tradition, um, you know, I've been going to Goldfinger shows for a while, and one of the traditions at the shows is, uh, you know, you come out in front of the, of the crowd and uh, someone grabs a Twinkie and puts it in a very familiar spot. Um, how did that whole thing start? Was, was it just an idea you had backstage, or was it a spur-of-the-moment kind of thing? It's funny you say that, because it actually was an idea we had backstage. When Charlie was out of the band, we had a guitar named Brian Arthur in the band for uh, a couple years. And we were playing this college show in California. And we walked off stage, and the crowd was just, we were so hungry, we saw a box of donuts. And so me and Brian started going at the donuts and eating them, like, so hungry. And uh, the crowd was like, one more song, one more song. And me and Brian are laughing at each other. Brian goes, why don't you go out there and stick this donut in your ass? And I bet you someone would eat it out. Like, do no way. There's, it's gross. There's no way someone would do that. He's like, just let's just do it, you know? So it was his idea. Yeah, so we walked out stage, and I had a box of donuts, and we're still eating them, and I go, who wants to hear another song? And uh, 
And they're like, oh my god, yeah! There's like a couple thousand people. And I go, I'll only play another song. I uh, will only play another song if somebody eats this joy donut out of my ass. <laughs> the hands went up. The hands came up. And me and Brian were like, wow, this is happening. And, and I would, uh, we walked up. We, we got the kid on stage. I think it was a girl. The first one was a girl. And she's like, I can't. I'll do, I'll do anything to hear you guys play more songs. And so I bent over. Brian stuck it in my butt cheeks. And the girl just grabbed it out and started eating it. Okay. And then it was, and it kind of morphed into a Twinkie because it's more cylindrical, it's shaped, and it's uh, just more funny right. to say Twinkie. So by, it, it, by, kind of, it kind of organically happened that way. By the time the tour hit Philly, it was a Twinkie at that point. Exactly. Uh, now, Darren, um, you're responsible for one of my all-time favorite TV moments, and hopefully you know what I'm talking about. It's when so. uh, Goldfinger played on Conan O'Brien, and uh, you know when you guys were done the song, you came up and you picked Conan up, and, uh, you know, so my question to you is, he's a big guy. And, you know, did you, did you know what you were doing when you went, went and picked him up? Or in the middle of when you picked him up, you're like, oh, shit, uh, I shouldn't have done this. Well, that was a, a complete spur of the moment thing. When we came off stage, we finished our song, and he started to hug us, and he jumped into us. And I wanted initially to get underneath him and pick him up on my shoulders. But uh -huh. I went in from the front. So when I, when I was picking him up, I was I actually suplexed him is what I did. I got underneath him and he he fell down. But so much I'm a big guy too. And there was so much adrenaline rushing through my body from just performing that when I picked him up he fell backwards and then I fell on him. Right. And then I picked him up by his crotch. And backstage he was so cool. He's, he said he was a little sore, but he was fine because he's a big guy and uh, we sent him a guitar and some flowers and and uh, it was great. And I saw him a few years later. Actually, a couple of years after that happened, he brought the clip on his best of shows when he was on Carson right. and Leno. And uh, we haven't been on, been on since. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that might have something to do with it. I saw him in Toronto for, uh, when, he, when Conan O'Brien came to Toronto to do some shows. And I was at the party and I saw him and I said, hey, do you remember me? And he goes, no. And I go, I'm in Goldfinger. He's like, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember you now. And so we had a nice chat and we shared a drink. And I said, look, you know what would be really funny is when we have a new record out, have us on the show. And it'll be predetermined. You're like, this is what happened last time this band was on. And they show the clip. Here they perform their new single, blah, blah, blah. Here's Goldfinger. And we play the song. And then we have some mats set up on the ground. But we cover them up with something. And then you, and then you grab me and throw me and pick me up and suplex me or drop me on the mats. And then you scream revenge. And I'll be like, Mom, I'll grab my back in agony. He goes, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. And he actually gave me his phone number and... Um, email of the guy who books the, the talent on the show. Okay. okay. So I had a little bit of a rapport going with him, and then when the record came out, I emailed him and said, hey, we're, we're out, we're on tour, uh, we'd love to come into Conan O'Brien, and it never came to fruition. So. Well, that's, you know why? Because you guys don't have a new album now, that's why. Well, this, this is when we actually did have a new record. Okay. Album. Well, that was my next, I was getting to, the, my next question was, you know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the most amount of time since the bands existed, um, you know, it's, you haven't had a new record. Is there anything you can tell me about, uh, you know, a new record coming out? Well, Hello Destiny was 2008, so we're coming up on five years now since, since a record, which is a long time. Uh, really, it, it just boils down to John Feldman. Uh, the guy is a, an accomplished producer, a very good producer, a very busy producer. So it's hard to pull his face out of the, the, the studio and twisting knobs and getting bands in order uh, for him to write and record material. We did record seven songs about six or seven months ago when I was in L.A. John just said, hey, learn these songs. I did. We recorded them. It was really quick. Um, I don't know if they're done, but there is about 15 more that i got to learn. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of John saying, hey, i got a week, i got a day, i got an hour, fly to L.A., and uh, let's record some more music. Um, it really is up to John Feldman. It's right. up to him when we tour, and it's up to him when we record music because he's just... He's got a lot on his plate right now. He's got to get it together. But no me. We need another Goldfinger <laughs> album soon. So, well, you're certainly keeping busy. Um, you're in a band called The Salads, and I, you know, I checked them out. And um, one thing about The Salads is they don't have to grow on you. You know, a lot of bands you listen to, and you're like, oh, I, I might, I might like it after a couple times listening to it. But right away, I mean, The Salads, you know what they're all about, and just cool songs. And like you said before, they kind of sound like some old Goldfinger songs. Um, but 
you know, when did, when did you join the band and, you know, what's, what's, is there any touring plans for the Salads? Because I know you guys kind of do kind of one-off shows. The band and me became friends right when I moved to, to Canada. I, I heard who they were, I heard the music, and I fell in love with it right away. And when they were recording their second record, it was called The Big Picture, and I would show up to rehearsal space just to hear the songs, and I slowly came into a producer role. Mm -hmm. I would tell them how the songs should be shaped and where the stops should be and how this and this, just kind of arranging and writing with them a little tiny bit. And then their drummer, Grant, quit, and they said to me, hey, Darren, you know, we need a drummer. Grant left the band. Would you, would you be willing to do some shows until we found a drummer? And I was like, okay, sure. So... I started to do some shows, I learned the set, I learned their material, and then basically here I am today. I haven't left the band yet, it's been a lot of fun for me, it keeps my chops up. Uh, they're great, great guys, amazing human beings, the music's incredible, everybody in the band is so good, like Dave on guitar and Chuck on bass are so incredibly good at their instruments, it's fun to play sure. with these guys. And Darren Dumas is a singer, Mr. D is a fantastic singer. And when we get together and jam, we, get, we write these amazing songs, and we just released a new record, my first record with the band, called Music Every Day. It's at the, the salads.com, the and it's only five bucks for, for the record, for the download, and it's so cheap, and we're just trying to get it out there as much as possible, and uh, there's some crazy shit on this record. There's some, some speed metal, there's some reggae, some dance hall, some punk, some pop. It's really, really cool. It's great. A music. lot of fun. I, I recommend people check it out, thesalads.com. Now, Darren, I want to do a quick uh, speed round. So basically, quickly, I'm going to name you five hockey teams, and I want you to tell me which jersey you would get from the team. Okay, pass, could be a past player, could be a current player, whatever you decide. I'm going to start off with my Flyers. God, do I have to name one? Because I hate the Flyers. <laughs> Like, um, I mean, I don't know how much of their history you know about, but in 1975, they won the Stanley Cup in six games against my Buffalo Sabres. Well, I, you know, uh, I'm not... So in Buffalo, so I really, I really kind of loathe that team. But if I had to get a jersey, uh, I would never. But if I had to get a jersey, man, oh, man, I don't know. Probably Bernie Perrant. Okay. Bernie uh, Perrant, I mean, that guy was amazing. Like, what a goaltender. Like, he won you two cups on his back. Because you just couldn't put a, you couldn't put a, a pee past that guy. Right. It was he was so insane those two years. Uh, he was insane, literally. He was a, a nut job, but he, he was a great goaltender. So I just loved watching Brittany Perron play goal at that time. I, I guess I should preface this with uh, my wife. Every year for Christmas, gets me a hockey jersey. So by the time I turned, you know, sixty, I should have all in it, all the NHL teams, and you know that would include teams that I hate. So I have the teams that like I the, hate, like, and I uh, still, like Pittsburgh. I have a Lemieux jersey already. I hate Le, I hate Pittsburgh, but I have a Lemieux jersey. I hate Lemieux. And, uh, and you know, and, and I had to pick the Rangers. I hate the Rangers, but I picked Mark Messier. <clears throat> yeah, you have to hate the Rangers. They're in your division, right? And ha and ha but how are you going to argue with Game Six in '94? You know, saying we're going to win, and then he scores a hat trick. I mean, I know it's insane. So, all right, so your second jersey is Montreal Canadiens. Oh, another team I love. You're on a roll. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was uh, an old Adams Division guy uh, in, in growing up, and the Mon now it's Northeast Division. so boring. I love when they had divisions named after hockey greats like Smythe and like Adams. and like That was just amazing. Campbell, Cup, like all, all that stuff. But anyway, um, Montreal Canadiens were in my division, and they, and they still play the Sabres hard. And the Sabres play the Montreal Canadiens very hard, and I don't like this, the Montreal Canadiens uh, because uh, back in 93, the Sabres were on a tear. They just swept Boston. Yeah, 93, this is when Montreal won the Cup against the Kings. Right. Sabres were on a tear. They just swept Boston in four straight games. They had Alexander McGillney, Pat LaFontaine, Dale Howardchuk, uh, Darren Pupa in, in, in that. They had great goaltending. Um... I think Grant Fear was in that, too. Um, and then they play Montreal, and they lose in four straight. McGillney breaks his leg. And Montreal goes on to, to win the Stanley Cup. So I don't like the Montreal Canadiens. But if I had to pick a jersey, I mean, there's so many names, so many great players looking at the history of that, of that franchise right. from where they, you know, when they started to where they are now. If I had to pick one name, oh, God. I, I, was, I, I guess the first name that pops in my head is Ken Dryden, even though I'm not a goaltender. I, I, I do like goaltenders quite a bit. If I had to pick one, it would probably be um, Guy Lafleur. Okay. Number 10. Because I, right? 
I remember watching Guy Lafleur play a little bit towards the end of his career. And man, oh man, what a graceful skater! He always smiled when he when he played. Smile on his face, even when he was like getting into a little scrap, smiling. Didn't never wear a helmet, so his hair fl- flew in the breeze. And right. what and a stick handle! The guy could stick handle through people in a, in a phone booth. <laughs> he was in- incredible. So Guy Lafleur for the Montreal Canadiens. All right, um, St. Louis Blues. Is that another yeah, Adams I division? I don't, I don't mind the Blues. Were they in the Adams division? What's that? Were that were the Blues in the Adams division? No, the the Blues are uh, Western Conference. Oh, they were Norris division. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to, I don't remember what division. Yeah, they probably were in Norris with Chicago, and, and that. But uh, God, St. Louis Blues. If I had to pick a St. Louis Blues jersey, I'm trying to think of a great St. Louis Blue from back in the day. Bernie, not Bernie Pratt. Uh, Bernie Federko was pretty good. You know, I think uh, I'm going to go with Bernie Federko. Okay. Because I was at Bernie Federko's um, retirement thing at, at, when I went to a game in St. Louis uh, to watch the Leafs play with some buddies. And they put Bernie Federko on the ice and they raised his banner to the ceiling. So it was a big, big thrill for me. I've seen Bernie play a couple times before he retired. So Bernie Federko. Okay. Uh, next one is Colorado Avalanche. Wow. I actually have a Joe Sackett jersey. Um, but if I just pick a name off the beaten path, probably Adam Foote. That's a good one. I love Adam Foote's defensive style. Solid as a rock. Always back there. Never made any mistakes. Was on the ice for like 30 minutes a game. Uh, big guy, so if you mess with him, he'd hit you. Um, just one of those like no like Lindstrom-style defensemen. Never made a mistake. Never coughed the puck up. Always made that first good pass out of the zone. Sometimes would carry it out of his zone and go end-to-end even though he wasn't known as like a Paul Coffey type defenseman, just a consummate, solid rock of a defenseman. And he's, he's won two Stanley Cups, and he's, he's, a, he's a great hockey player. Adam Foote. Good, good one. Um, all right, and the last one is your Buffalo Sabres. God, I have about 15, 20 <laughs> Sabres jerseys. Where do I start? I mean, I've had names like really obscure names like Christian Rutu. I've had McGillian jersey, LaFontaine, Howard Chuck. Um, Right now, I, 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 for a while, I was a Maxim Afeniganov guy. Uh, I have a Ryan Miller jersey. I have a Tyler Myers jersey. I might pick up a um, Tyler Ennis jersey because he just signed a two-year deal. Okay. So he'll be there for a couple of years. And this guy's incredible. He's like Maxim Afeniganov. He got all the hands. He got all the little spin moves, but he actually finishes. He, and that was one thing about Max Svenigoff I didn't like. He, he could spin and twist and move around a guy, kind of similar to the way Russ Cortnell played. Mm-hmm. Lots of spin moves, lots of stick handling, but when it came time for him to shoot the puck, he never shot the puck. It's like, you're in a lane, shoot the damn puck. <laughs> and he'd try to pass off to some guy, and it would be tipped and be like, oh, you made all those great plays. If you just would have put the puck on that, you would have had a, a great play. But uh, Tyler Ennis, if I had to pick a name, would be Tyler Ennis, because I just love the way this kid plays. Okay, now... The, the 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 what you just described to me kind of reminded me of uh, and I might get his name wrong because obviously I don't get the Buffalo feed, but Rick Jenneret is that the announcer? That's right, you got it. So I had NHL Center Ice like maybe in two thousand eight, and I would just get so excited when I got the Buffalo feed because this guy, I mean, he could he could announce you know a dog show and make it the most exciting thing you've ever heard. So do do you have a favorite uh, Jenneret quote? There's a few of them. I mean, obviously the classic one I think most hockey fans know is La 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 right. Fontaine, that one. Yep. Um, or when the Sabres were going to the uh, finals, I believe it was 99, uh, when they just kept winning and winning and winning, he was like, these guys are good, scary good. That's another good one. Okay. Or do, do you believe, do you believe is another one. that was like, that this team could actually have a chance to make to make an impact in the in the fun. But La 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 Fontaine is probably his most famous famous call. Okay, we would have also accepted May Day May Day. Oh May Day, I was at that game. That's right. That's right. May Day. Yeah. And the top I was at that game. That was Game Four of '93 against Boston. Okay. When Brad when Brad May went around Ray Bork, went around like a pylon, and then top top shelf against Andy Moe. I was at that game. Standing room only tickets. Wow. Um, and then the, the other one was uh, Top Shelf where Mama Hides the Cookies. That's my favorite. Mama Hides the Cookies is another good one, too. All right, we do another segment on here called uh, Turn It Up or Turn It Off. So I'm going to name you five songs, and you just simply tell me if you turn it up or turn it off. 
Oh, are these uh, popular songs or? Yeah, you'll know them. Because All right. So I, tr I, tr I did a little theme with this one. First one is Jump by Van Halen. Jump from Van Halen. You turn that way, way, way up. I mean, without Van Halen, one of the most influential U.S. rock bands, I mean, ever. They were so much fun live. I saw them on that tour in, on 84. I might be dating myself. But they were incredible. They were unbelievable. Just a ball of energy. And that record was a, a sign of things to come. It was a great record. It had Hot for Teacher on it, Drop Dead Legs, of course, Jump. At Panama, it had so many great, great singles on it. But you could definitely tell they were getting more into a pop synthesizer mode. Sure. Um, and it's kind of similar to Metallica and the Black Record, a great record. You know, Enter Sandman, Sad but True. But you could definitely see they were getting into a slower, kind of cheesier realm with like songs like The Unforgiven, and uh, which, but it's, and then you know they went into Load right after that, which was a complete garbage. And then Van Halen went into 5150 after 84, which again, complete garbage. Nothing against Sammy, great, great vocalist, very distinctive voice, great singer, good guitar player, but it was not the Van Halen I fell in love with. So that song Jump was like an incredible single, a, a boring video, but but uh, just a great song. Every time I hear it, I'm like, yeah, I turn it up. I agree with that. I mean, that's it's a timeless song. It's a timeless album. Um, your next song is Jump For My Love by the Pointer Sisters. I see you're on a theme here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what? Porter Sisters are legendary. I mean, they're, they're a legendary uh, little group there. I would turn that up. I, I'm not going to go into great exclamation like I did with Van Halen. Okay. I, I, I don't mind, I don't mind the Pointer Sisters. I don't mind the Pointer Sisters. They're, they're okay. They're cool. I'm turn it up. Bad about, about the Pointer Sisters. I mean, come on. All right, next one exactly. is Jump On It. And I don't have the artist. I think it's the Apache. Jump On It. Jump On It. Uh, I mean, it depends if I'm drunk. <laughs> if I'm if I'm drunk and at a party and that comes on, yeah, why not? Okay. But right now, if you played it, I'd probably ask you to turn it on. Okay. <laughs> Next one is "Jump" by Criss Cross. Oh, the Daddy Mac will make you jump, jump. The Mac Daddy will make you. Oh God, one hit wonder. I wonder what you know. I wonder what those guys are doing right now. I wonder what the Daddy Mac and the Mac Daddy are doing right now. They're probably like in their like late twenties. Maybe early 30s. Like, oh, I wonder what those kids are doing. I wonder if they're like working at McDonald's, or if they've started, if they've invested their money well and they're and they're doing well. I like, imagine they being, still talk to each other. Yeah, exactly. True. I, imagine being like the Mac Daddy, and you go to a job interview, and it says you were in crisscross as the Mac Daddy, and you're sitting across the table from a guy trying to get a job, and he's like, "I see here that you were the Mac Daddy." <laughs> <laughs> Would that be hilarious? Doesn't quite but, uh, translate to the God. real world very well. I would say, I would say, uh, yeah, turn it off. That's not my thing. All right. Um, so I'm two and two right <laughs> Last one is Jump Around by House of Pain. Oh, God, turn it up. Absolutely. Come on, turn it up. I mean, it doesn't get much more Irish, thuggery, hip-hop than House of Pain. I mean, their rhymes weren't, in, like, that hard to decipher. And, you, and the, the pop culture references they made in, like, Jump Around and Shamrocks and Shenanigans and the other songs they had on that record were so easily all recognizable. Oh, I know that record. I know that band. I know that TV show. I know that movie. I know that character. It was it was so, so cool. And it was perfect for the time. Uh, right around those, those, those mid to early 90s. So, yeah, turn that way, way, way up. All right. We got the, we got the jump theme there. Um, last thing, Darren, I've got the book of questions right here. Okay, so there's 200 questions in this book, and I would like you to pick a number between 1 and 200, and I think I know what number you're going to pick, but I'll let you say it. 99. That's what I thought. <laughs> All right, uh-oh, this is a long one. Oh, you're boy. driving late at night in a safe but deserted neighborhood when a dog suddenly darts in front of your car. Though you slam on the brakes, you hit the animal. Would you stop to see how injured the animal was? And if you did so and found the dog was dead but had a name tag, would you contact the owner? Oof. Oh boy, way to way to finish the show. I know. Uh, I like uh, some of the <laughs> some of the questions are, are are just like you know, what's your perfect night out? You know, it's just like this book ranges from everything. I prefer that one, uh, <laughs> but you know, I picked that guy, so let's let's do the dog thing. Uh, I would have no choice but to, you know, if I killed it right away, I would hope that I killed it instantly. I'd, ho I'd hope that I go in front of my car and the dog was dead and not suffering. Uh -huh. That would really break my heart. 
Uh, but I would do the right thing, the moral thing, and I'd have to pick up the phone and call the owner and go, I, got, I have terrible news. You know, your, your dog just jumped in front of my car, and I had no choice. I, I, I tried to stop, but unfortunately I killed it. I'm terribly, terribly sorry. All right, let's let's get on. That was definitely a buzzkill question. I mean, if it was a human, if it was a human being, I, I'd drive away. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, what is your you even if the human had a tag? You've obviously been to a ton of hockey games. What is your best hockey memory? God, there's a few. Uh, Gretzky scoring his 802nd is right up there at the top. Mm-hmm. It doesn't right have to there, be a. Right it doesn't have to be a game you went to either. It can be one you watched on TV. The one that's still, but that one's still one of the best. Mm-hmm. I was there to watch Wayne Gretzky score 802 goals, passing his his boyhood hero. Um, I thought it was 803. Sorry, 803 goals. The record was 802. Okay. Scored his 803rd goal against the Vancouver Canucks, Kurt McLean. At the Great Western Forum in Los Angeles, when I didn't have a ticket to get in, I was circling the building. Golfing area was just starting out. We were unsigned. I would take a bus down La Brea in Los Angeles to Englewood, which is a bad neighborhood. And then I would walk a mile to the Great Western Forum, and I would circle the building because it's round. Circle it until a door opened. And right around this time, the press were following Gretzky. and It was tough. Like, so I found this usher, and he's like, look, I'll let you in. But you gotta like spend like twenty five bucks or thirty bucks, whatever it is, to get. In. When the door opens, you're handing money to the guy, and then you're in. You're on your own. Like that's fine. I just want to be in the building. So the door opened. The guy gave me the way. Like come on in. And, I, and he held the door and he pushed it. So by the time I got to the door, I grabbed it just before it shut. I opened it. I peeked my head in, and the guy was gone. So I walked in and I stood there by the door like this, just waiting for the guy to show up because I had the money, and he, and he didn't show up. So I'm like, all right, you know, screw this. I'm, I'm in. So I started walking and walking and walking, and I see on the ground a, a season ticket uh, stub. And it was like a, a, had the logos on it and everything. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Mm-hmm. So I folded it up, put it in my pocket. No more than five minutes later, a security guy grabbed me. And the guy who opened the door was like, that's him. And I go, what's the problem? He's like, you, what, you snuck in. I go, I'm a season ticket holder. <laughs> Get off of me. And they let me go. And I sat next to the handicap people, and I watched Gretzky score that goal. It was a big, big thrill for me. That is a, that is a great story. That is an unbelievable story. I, I guess one recent would be two years ago, 2010, Team USA in Vancouver for the Olympics. Um, Ryan Miller in net for Team USA. USA down by a goal. They pull Ryan Miller, and, and Parise scores the game-tying goal. With 19 seconds on the clock, and I'm in Canada wearing my USA hat, uh-huh. my USA jersey, my little USA flag. Everybody in the bar is like flipping me off and calling me names, good natured. Yeah. And I, after Parise scored that goal to tie it up, put it into overtime, I stood up and started cheering. There's time on the clock. What do you? They were like, no, 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 no. We want the goal. Right. We want the goal. And I, kept, I was nursing my beer, and I'm like. There's time on the clock. Why are you cheering? It's not a two-goal lead or a three-goal lead. Right. It's a one-goal lead. And just like that, they score that goal, and I stood up. I swear to God, Joey, it was like it was like a freaking mortuary. A cemetery it was silent, like a library, silent. Nobody said a word, and I was like, there's time on the clock. And people were like, rrr, rrr. And then Crosby scores that amazing goal with that amazing pass from uh, Aginla. The pass was better than the goal. Watch, watch the highlight. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, I just stood in, my, stood in my chair, and everybody's tapping me on the back and pushing me. And I had my face in the beer, just like this. Just finally got up after 20 minutes, and I had 76 text, text messages, mostly from Canadians like, ha ha, loser. Right, right. <laughs> I see. walk out into the streets of Toronto, and it is like they won the Stanley Cup. Everybody is partying. And people are looking at me and pointing and laughing because I'm wearing the jersey and I got the hat on. But uh, what a memory that was. What a game. What, what a gold medal game that was. That was an unbelievable. So I'm looking forward. I'm really looking forward to 2014 in Sochi in, in Russia for some sweet revenge. Because by then we'll have Jonathan Quick in that, uh, who's amazing, obviously. Oh, yeah. I mean, Miller will still be there. Maybe, maybe Thomas. He's a bit of a nut bar these days. Uh, Maybe Thomas and and, uh, and and Howard will be the, the backup. And, and I mean, who's going to be in net for for Canada? I mean, who's the great Canadian goaltender nowadays? Brodeur's done, uh, and by in my two years he'll be retired. Yeah. Luongo uh, went south. Luongo, but Luongo didn't win that game. 
Luongo didn't have great goaltending. It was it was all those amazing forwards, like you know, like Taves and 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 uh, Aginla and Crosby and Steven Stamkos. Like Steven Stamkos wasn't even on the team then. Mm-hmm. Like we're we're gonna be in tough. But who's gonna be in net? Luongo will be there probably. Maybe Carey Price from from Montreal. But besides that, they don't have any great goal. Like we have Quick, right? Who's gonna be awesome? So at least I hope in two years. The only thing so I, I just can't wait for sweet. Sweet revenge in fourteen. That was a. I mean, that was a weird game to watch. I mean, see, the thing is, you would you got over that loss the next day. If Canada didn't win that game, there would have been you know riots on the street like when Vancouver lost the Stanley Cup, probably. But the the thing that was weird about that game was Mike Richards, who was the captain of the Flyers at that time. He would always, you know, he had a big rivalry with Sidney Crosby, and I just, it was weird seeing them together with gold medals. Like, I didn't want them to be happy together. Does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah, no, it totally does. And it's weird because uh, Miller obviously led in the game-winning goal, and the co- one of the assistant coaches for Canada was um, the coach of the Sabres, Lindy Ruff. And then when they're shaking hands, it's, they, they shook hands and he gave him a little pat on the back saying, you know, and then later on, it was revealed that you know you did a great job, and you were the MVP of the tournament, and you know you should you have nothing to be ashamed about, and and you know lift your head up high, and we'll see you in training camp. So that was weird, right? Seeing, you know, Lindy Ruff get a gold medal was his goalie, his All Star goalie, wins silver. What? I was just surprised that the Team USA even medaled at all. I really was. I thought that they were going to go in, and I said if they make it to the medal round, I'll be thrilled. If they hit bronze, I'll be thrilled. Because there was Sweden with the Sundin twins and, and Lindstrom and, and the guys like that. And then you had, with um, Henrik Lundqvist in that, then you had the Czech Republic guys and, and, and you had, like, there was so many great teams. Yeah. Canada, obviously. There were so many great teams in that tournament. Like there are every year at international play. I didn't think America had a shot. Yeah, so when you looked at the matter. roster against, you know, Ovechkin and, you know, it was... It's weird to see Yamir Yager was still oh, yeah, playing. Russia. I forgot about Russia. Yeah, there's Ru- all those great Russian guys. Like I didn't think, like between Russia, Czech Republic, Sweden, and Canada, I'm like, oh, those are the those are the four powerhouses. Right. There's no way America is going to medal. Right. But to get to the gold medal game and to get to one goal away from getting that gold medal, my hats off to to the coaching and, and obviously Ryan Miller stood on his head. I I wanted to ask about Lindy Ruff. Why has he lasted so like in Philadelphia? He would have been out of town by, you know, 2003. How, how has he stayed so long as, as the Buffalo coach? I think, you know, he's, he's survived a few uh, regime changes, uh, you know, with the Riga era, and then Angolasano came in, and now Terry Bakula is there. And I think he survived because he has the pulse of the team. And although he may not see results, like last year they, they finished uh, ninth, a couple points out of the playoff spot, um, but there, he has had success. He's brought the team to a couple conference finals. He's brought the team to one Stanley Cup final. Uh, apparently, he has the dressing room. What I'm hearing from different players and different execs around the, the league is that he has the room. And when he walks in and he says something, everybody listens. Right. He's a respected coach. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, good, he's a good player's coach. Uh, and he seems to have the pulse of that team. And a lot of the times, coaches get fired because the all-star guy, like Boudreaux got fired in Washington because Ovechkin didn't like him. Mm-hmm. And he might have lost it. He might have lost that room. But it seems like Lindy Ruff is, is a guy that the players res- respect. He was a player. He doesn't have any B- BS. He doesn't fluff players up. He doesn't cater to egos. He just wants results. Kind of like Barry Trotz, another long-term guy in Nashville. So I'm, a, I'm a kind of on a fence here because he's, he does a good job. He's a good coach. But maybe the time is to come to see what's out there. Because he hasn't brought the team to a Stanley Cup since 99. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's been like 13 years. So it's, it's, maybe it's about time to, we'll give him one more season. If he doesn't make the Stanley, Stanley Cup playoffs this season, if there is even is a season, yeah. then I think it's time for him to move on. I really, I really thought 2004, or it might have been 05, whenever they lost to uh, the Hurricanes, when the Hurricanes won the Cup, I thought that yeah. was the Sabres year to win the Cup for sure. Because they, you know, they had yeah, they played them hard. They, they played them hard. Uh, they took they, they took some dumb penalties in that conference finals, mm-hmm. some really really dumb penalties. And uh, man, oh man, Cam Ward was unbelievable. He was just unbeatable. The guy, I mean, if you get a hot goaltender, I mean, look what Quick did. Yeah, he was a good goaltender all season long, but he wasn't Stanley Cup caliber goaltending. Absolutely. 
Cam Ward tur turned into a brick wall that, that whole series. He was just tough to beat. Spe uh, and if you, you got a goaltender who's stopping everything, you're, it gets into the players' heads. Yeah. Well, speaking, speaking of goaltending, I mean, there's no more scrutinized position in Philadelphia than the goaltending position. You know, Ilya Brzgalov had great seasons in uh, Phoenix. He comes to Philadelphia. He wasn't bad, but he wasn't, you know, the $6 million guy that we're paying him for. And, uh, you know, if I don't know how it works with, with getting guests on your show, but if you can try to get Brzgalov, either it's going to be the greatest interview you've ever done, or, I don't know, that guy's going to give you nothing. But he is the most out-there guy. I don't know if you watched the 24-7 uh, series on HBO. Yeah. But that, yeah. this guy is out of his mind. I mean, I love listening to the guy talk, but I, I need him to stop more pucks. Yeah, he's a weird anomaly there in, in that in Philadelphia. He's a good goaltender, obviously. He showed what he can do in, in, in Phoenix. and he, He's got the skills. That's, that's for sure. He, he's a good goaltender. But he's not really coming into his own in, in Philadelphia. And there's some kind of weird eeriness in the air in Philadelphia when goaltenders come in. Mm -hmm. They come in highly touted. They come in with all the, all the preparedness, ready to go into a great season, and then they just fall flat on their face. Yeah. Uh, th there's moments of brilliance. I mean, even with Roman Czechmonic, there was moments of brilliance with him. Philadelphia hasn't had a great goaltender, like a great top five lead goaltender since Hextall. I mean, Ron Hextall, to me, was your last great goaltender. Yeah. Well, in his prime. He's, I mean, we got Van Beesbrook. What was that? I mean, you, you, you got to find you got to find a great culture. I mean, I, you leave it to the brass and, and home, home, what's, uh, what's the GM there name? Um, Holmgren. Holmgren? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he's doing his job. He looked at, I, I think Briscoff got paid maybe $2 million more than he should get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd probably peg him at about four, four and a half tops. Well, uh, I, maybe that maybe that screw maybe that screws with guys. They get the contract and they, they they feel the expectation is that they have to play to a six million dollar level, but they're only at like a four million dollar level. Right. Maybe it's the the fact that the, the defense let them out to dry a lot of the times. Um, maybe the players lost confidence in them. But it's it's the toughest position in professional sports. I mean, you got forwards for days. You have Claude Giroux, the all star. Right. Got the uh, guys. Where are you gonna where are you gonna have your successes with that guy? Absolutely. You know, and guys like Hartnell. Yeah, playing with Drew. I mean, maybe, hard, maybe, hard. if Pronger can, can come back and play some games, he'll have. You know, but he's he's old and he's damaged, so I doubt he'll he'll see any more ice. Do you know what we're he's getting, talking about? Do you know what we're getting with uh, Luke Shen? I know nothing about this guy, but he was in Toronto for so long. Look, I, he's a prospect. I wouldn't say he's a blue chip prospect, but he's definitely a prospect. He's got some good puck moving skills. He's got some size. He's a little gritty. But he doesn't take chances defensively. And one of the things that I found when I watched him play in Toronto was, and you don't want your defenseman to take chances, but sometimes you do. I mean, if there's a lane, run it. What he would do is he would come up the ice and make that first pass, and then he'd pick off in a neutral zone, and there'd be a turnover. And he would just he just couldn't transition from turning the puck over mentally to getting into a defensive stance. Uh, he's got a great shot. He's smart. He's well-liked. I, I think he'll pay dividends for Philadelphia long term sometimes you need uh, a change of scenery and you go into another team and then boom you flourish yeah and he's with his uh, brother it didn't happen, it didn't happen with Briz Gall, but it probably will happen with Luke Shen I mean maybe Vance Reem, Van Riemdijk's, uh, uh James Van Riemsdyk comes to Toronto and becomes the great the great player that everybody claimed he would be when he got to uh, to Philadelphia see with him they never see he was injured the entire year they he never got his full shot I mean he had you know Flyers had a horrible playoff Two, two seasons ago, but Ram, Van Reems like had like seven goals. He would carry it, you know, past the blue line every time. It just charged. Nobody could get the puck from him. And then the next year, you know, he plays ten games, gets injured, plays another ten games, gets injured, and then they get rid of him. I mean, he, he never got his full shot here. Well, like I said, sometimes the change of scenery is all a player needs. Comes in, a new system, a new coach, a new dressing room, a new set of friends. A fresh start, a clean slate. Sometimes that's what a guy needs, and I think that's going to pay dividends for James, and I think it's going to do well for for, um, for Shen in Philadelphia. All right, Darren. Well, hopefully they drop the puck this year. You know, there's no way to predict what's going to happen, but, um, you know, I know you're a busy guy, and, uh, you know, thanks. I, I really appreciate you doing this. I've been a Goldfinger fan for a long time, and uh, I will keep listening to Sport Beats because that's, Combining, you know, the music you play with interviewing hockey players, there's no better podcast out there. So, thanks, thanks again man. For doing that means this. a lot to me. Thank you. All right, Darren.